Yu-Gi-Oh! 5 Ds kicked off with a Nitro Field BANG! Thanks to powerful dark support, psychic tuners, and synergizing synchro summonable savages. With all the pomp and circumstance for this new era, came along a rather egregious tier 0 format where, despite there being representation from some decks like Light Sworn and Zombie, the Teledad strategy was simply dominant for those who couldn't afford expensive cardboard. Something had to change, or else the game of Yu-Gi-Oh would enter a dark age. Pun intended. This was the 5Ds era, the future of card games. It should be an optimistic horizon, not one cast into the shadow realm. And as such, a few big things did happen from both a game standpoint and from a production point of view. So let's start with the infamous production lawsuit, which actually started in late 2008. For those who played Yu-Gi-Oh! back in the day knows that Upper Deck UDE, was the original production company in North America, whereas Konami was in charge of production in Japan, and the original source for that matter. Well, one day, Konami found out that a California distributor was selling counterfeit cards. To be fair, what the hell is a Julie? The business, Vintage Sports Cards, said they received the product from UDE, which then of course UDE denied the claims. Both UDE and Konami went at each other for breach of contract, slander, general involvement, and the idea behind Extra Link. Seriously, who thought that was a good idea? Konami was adamant to get production away from UDE, and while they failed in European court, this did not deter them. Upper Deck was still making plans for future product, all the while upcoming releases and events were stilted. Neither company was going to give up until the last draw phase. After a few wins on Upper Deck's side, Konami finally cited evidence, in which I hope it was a darkly big rabbi, and eventually the California court ruled in their favor. Once the European court re-ruled in Konami's favor on April 15, 2009, this allowed the Big K to not only gain control of Yu-Gi-Oh! in North America, but worldwide as well. It was about time they created their idealistic Duelist Kingdom, nay, Duelist World, an end to the Upper Deck era. Compared to previous internal dealings, this was a big deal. You look at examples which included delayed releases, like the first core set of this format, or other side sets, or the fact that there were only a few major events, and you can understand that duelists were unsure if the game in the West was even going to continue beyond this. So with the limited ongoings of the metagame, did anything make a splash during this period? Between the end of Teladad format at SJ Houston to the start of the following format, there were a couple of noticeable releases. Firstly would be on February 24th, which is Duelist Pack Yusei, mainly featuring Armory Arm, an early level 4 synchro which is easy to make thanks to new cards, Tuning Wear, and Fortress Warrior. Secondly would be the March Shonen Jump Volume 7 Issue 3 promotional card, Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon. This fusion monster can be summoned by sending from the field to the grave a cyber dragon and one or more machine type monsters. Take note that the materials does not need to be your side only, making Chimera Tech solid and unorthodox monster removal. Speaking of March, the first day of the month would be the ban list that didn't actually ban any cards, wow. The list was clearly made to hit the top decks and shake up the meta. Look at the limited cards. Chaos Sorcerer just got off being forbidden, but Dad, Gladiator Beast Bestiari, Goyo Guardian, Mizuki, Plague Spreader Zombie, Card of Safe Return, Itelli, and Rota were all limited. Now that's what I call a limited list. Semi-limited did not disappoint either, with big hits including Malicious, Goblin Zombie, Green Baboon, Allure, Destiny Draw, and the soon-to-be-released Summoner Monk. Unlimited would have some cards too, however the point was made. Teledad and Zombie were chopped to bits, and even Gladiator Beast were finally hit in some capacity. Honestly, out of all the hits in regards to last format, Lightsworn came out looking the best because, by all intents and purposes, they were still at full power. Goyo Garden would make history as the first synchro on the illustrious list, despite Stardust and Black Rose being the most prominent synchros from Teledad format. 
but I get it. Goya was still incredibly strong, and Black Rose helps out most decks in general, plus Stardust is the anime protagonist ace monster. Which is kind of a shitty reason, but with the recent reprint in the Duelist pack, Konami isn't going to let the meta scene interrupt their cash flow. All that said, would this help Yu-Gi-Oh exit a tier 0 environment? Only a couple days later would be the first core set of the format, that being Crimson Crisis, that introduced primarily the Assault Mode and Blackwing archetypes. Assault Mode cards revolve around pre-existing big monsters just with a powered up form. While they're quite decent, they never exactly made a strong meta impact. Black Wings, on the other hand, did make an impact as the first wave of what would become a prominent deck started here, which we'll get to soon enough. Apart from all the decent cards like Arcanite Magician for Destruction, Black Salvo for an upcoming meta deck, Dark Voltanus was a nice dark type for counter fairies, Alien and Plant getting support too, the biggest single card from Crimson Crisis had to be the level 7 synchro Dark Strike Fighter. Upon release, this 2600 attack machine had generic synchro materials with the effect that you can tribute one monster on your field to inflict damage to your opponent equal to its level times 200. This could be during either main phase 1 or main phase 2, and multiple times in a turn. So one DSF direct attack plus burning himself would be 4000 points of damage. If you could get 2 on an open board, well, that's game. Be careful when using Psalm Judgment in this environment. This format is the prominent time period revolving around this OTK, thanks to a deck we'll also discuss soon. Oh, and remember, Verdant Sanctuary is not a field spell. While not as groundbreaking as the first two 5D sets, Crimson Crisis had plenty of variety to be another positive release. Speaking of which, on March 31st, we would get a new release, a new structure deck in Spellcaster's Command. This new spellcaster deck included reprints of previously high rarity cards, Dark Red Enchanter, Handball Necromancer, and Magical Exemplar. But like Crisis, there would be one sole impact card here, and that's none other than Summoner Monk. Monk's whole shtick is that you can discard a spell to special a level 4 from your deck and it cannot attack. The cost and downside were fine because in this era, you want more monsters on the field to access the extra deck with. Summon out a tuner, and bam, you got your first turn synchro just like that. It was clear Monk would be a major player considering he's already semi-limited on the March list. Into the next month on April 21st would be Gold Series 2009, the second gold set. Last year's brought us a much needed Crush Card Virus reprint for general consumption, and 2009 did not disappoint with reprints of Dark Arm Dragon, Death Volts Golf, and Gold Sarcophagus first set release post SJC prize card. Nice. Speaking of prize cards, the next event on the 26th would be the premier event for the final SJC prize card, and that is Dark End Dragon. This Dragon Synchro can lose 500 attack and defense to send a monster your opponent controls to the grave. Not bad, I must say, considering it starts with 26k attack at 21k defense. It certainly has shades of light and darkness dragon. The event stated is SJ Anaheim, where Jeff Jones won with a surprise variant of Teledad. Anti-meta beatdown. What? While yes, the Teledad strategy was in ruins, the cards were still not banned, and therefore theoretically still playable in a meta sense. This is, at least in Jones' mindset, usable if adopted in another strategy that would complement it. That pairing would be skill drain because many monsters in the deck could run under it. Dad Summon, Malicious, Plague Spreader, and Beast King Barbaros. Barbaros was the May Shonen Jump Volume 7 Issue 6 promotional card, which would have become available in April. This 3k beater can be normal summon without tributing if you reduce its attack. But if you tributed three monsters for it, it destroys all cards your opponent controls. However, that wasn't important. Its stats and base effect were. This guy under skill drain was way better than a Fusilier Dragon, and its 19k non-tribute summon wasn't terrible either as far as stats go. In Anaheim, duelists weren't quite sure where the meta went with duelists trying previous decks like Lightsworn and Glad. So it's unsurprising that Jeff Jones adapted first with this surprise first place deck. 
also in April would be the France Nationals, where Top 8 saw probably the most rogue deck of the format, Harpy Oppression. This deck used powerful beaters backed up by burn and control cards. This would be the first instance of a topping wing beast deck in this format. One day after my birthday on May 12th would be the last core set of the format, Raging Battle. Meta defining cards would be Ojama Blue, Ojama Red, and Ojama Country. Okay, maybe not, but for real, the key cards are Power Tool Dragon, Deep Sea Diva, Forbidden Chalice, Black Whirlwind, One for One, Grave of the Super Ancient Organism, and Trap Stun. Power Tool is a generic level 7 synchro that can help pull equips from deck for possible OTKs. Chalice is a quick effect, Effect Negate. Deep Sea Diva is a tuner that can get out a low level Sea Serpent from deck. Grave is a high leveled Monster Floodgate. One for one tutors out any level 1 monster, and Trap Stun negates all traps for a turn. A lot of cool and useful cards in this set, even if not all would be format defining. I'm talking about cards like GB Hunter, Giga Stone Omega, Swallow's Nest, Kawaki Meru Guardian, and even the Earthbound Immortals. Plus with the new Blackwing cards, the final pieces were in place for Blackwing to finally take roost in a competitive nest. Raging Battle had a clear emphasis in card design to pull cards from the deck, which was needed to help the Synchro mechanic be relevant during its early days, unlike, say, Rituals or Fusions. But that's not all! The meta was not defined yet because on June 9th, Starter Deck Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's 2009, yeah, original name, came out with two new big cards, X-Saber Urbellum and X-Saber Airbellum. Urbellum is a solid generic synchro, whereas Airbellum can rip a card out of your opponent's hand if it lands a direct attack. It's also a level 3 beast type tuner that, guess what? It can be summoned off Rescue Cat. All that would lead into Dark Strike Fighter and its OTK. The combo would be to block the back row, whether with Heavy Storm, Giant Truinade, or Cold Wave, and then you Summoner Monk for another Monk, and then for Rescue Cat, and then get out two Air Bellums and use the monsters on your field for two DSFs. Then attack directly with both and tribute both for 8,000. Bam, mic drop. Honestly, all you need is a Summoner Monk and two spells in hand for the combo to work. Unlike Demise OTK of 2007, this was a non-gimmick, easy to pull off OTK, and due to the importance of DSF in this format and this one alone, is the reason it's called Dark Strike Format. June 20th would be Dual Terminal Preview Wave 2. This arcade thingy introduced Ally of Justice Cataster, a pretty solid synchro that, due to limited distribution of the cards, made it not legal in the TCG until a later reprint. The last release I want to cover is on July 7th with Duelist Pack Yugi, which featured reprints with problem-solving card text and an alternate art of polymerization. I remember being very confused seeing this art in the Duel Monsters anime, and up till this point in the TCG releases of Poly, they had some weird other art, which turned out to be the original Japanese art. I don't know why the TCG did that, it's one of the few alt arts with its own set code. July was also the national season. Firstly, we'll cover the Canadian Nationals, where Charles Easton won with Synchro Cat using the OTK I mentioned. Like I alluded to, DSF was the strongest synchro at this time for its game-ending capabilities. The Rescue Cat strategy made Pot of Avarice easier to use than ever, and despite the synchro pool still being small, you had other great options too like Colossal Fighter, Goyo Guardian, Black Rose Dragon, Arcanite Magician, and even Gaia for sheer power. Really, this was the first format where you had to consider how to fit a range of levels in your extra deck. The new releases 100% made an impact because with e Telly being unreliable at 1 and Summoner Monk in as the new monster pooler with Air Bellum as the new popular tuner, Synchros were taken to new heights. At the US Nationals, we even saw a Light Sworn deck in the top 16, which as I mentioned during the ban list was not a surprise given how they were at full power with Judgment Dragon, Charge of the Light Brigade, and Solar Recharge all being around. 
come early August would be the 2009 World Championships, where second would go to Cat Gladiator Beast, combining the OTK potency of Synchro Cat and the versatility of Glad. I mean, Rescue Cat could also get you out Test Tiger or Gladiator Beast Sam Knight, of whom was released in Crimson Crisis. First place, however, would go to Blackwing, which came close to victory at the Canadian Nationals, getting to second by Matt Peddle. This time, though, Blackwing won. This was the dark deck of the format, of the Winged Beast variety. It's a deck that was easy to play, but hard to master, requiring knowledge on card advantage, reading back row, and understanding the Starlight Road to Victory. This was because they relied on a grind game if DSF didn't win them a game first. After all, their main strategy was to go into level 7 synchros and use Black Whirlwind to understand what the opponent had set. A majority of its monsters could do something useful, special summoning themselves, attack buffs, graveyard manipulation, etc. Although the deck was weak to crush card virus and couldn't really use it either, which by this point, CCV was still one of the strongest cards in the game. In fact, one of the new decks by the last event about a week later at SJ Indianapolis had a deck that didn't mind CCV. Salvo Dad. It's another dark deck that loved Synchros. This one had the strategy of using Black Salvo, a new tuner monster that could special a dark machine from your grave, which typically was the Koichi. In addition, the deck still used remnants of Dad Return from early 2008, like Destiny Heroes and Return from a Different Dimension. This was the definition of Under the Radar, making it to Top 64 by Adam Korn. Other tops of this event included Gladiator Beast, now that Teledad wasn't pushing it away, Synchro Cat at 2nd place, and 1st place going to Philly Luna's Blackwing deck. Indianapolis was a great showcase of the bizarre nature of Dark Strike format. A combo-heavy format that, while having an easy OTK strategy and only a few top decks, it was never a tier 0 environment and all the decks, Synchro Cat, Blackwing, Salvo Dad, Glad, and even Cat Glad and Anti-Meta Teledad all saw high-level play like a Mexican standoff, some earlier, some later in the format's lifespan. The job of the March list was to change the meta immensely, and between that and the new releases, not even a lawsuit could stop the locomotion that is the meta game. Say what you want about what the format did wrong. All things considered, it was a success. Perhaps Dark Strike Fighter was too strong for its own good, and even still, Blackwing showed that it had a solid grind game. Light Swarm was arguably at its peak, and even Glad came back to the point where non-Glad decks were main decking a copy of Geyseris just in case. Plus, a good side deck with cards like Scapegoat, Threatening Roar, and Skill Drain could carry weight. The Synchro Era marches on past the Crimson Crisis at the crossroads of chaos and into a bright, bright future.